Zoe Kravitz was one of many celebrities that condemned the actions of Will Smith that took place at the 2022 Oscars last Sunday. However, unlike other celebrities, she was immediately exposed and cancelled for her past interactions with the family, namely Jaden Smith, Will's son. Let's get into the real reason why Zoe Kravitz got cancelled. After Will Smith slapped Chris Rock following a joke about his wife Jada's bald head, Hollywood was left in shock over how to deal with the incident. Zoe Kravitz was one of the people that shared her disapproval on Instagram. A few days after the event, she posted a photo of her outfit at the award show with a caption reading, quote, Here's a picture of my dress at the award show where we are apparently assaulting people on stage now. A few hours later, she was showing off her outfit for the after party, and the caption on that photo read, quote, and here's the picture of my dress at the party after the award show, where we are apparently assaulting people on stage now. Immediately, she started to get pushback, with commenters telling her she should stay out of it, and it's not her place to comment on what happened between the two men. Then things got significantly worse when people on Twitter brought up some old interviews that she gave, where she spoke about Jaden Smith, Will, and Jada's son. Many of her comments were deemed inappropriate, and she was quickly called out for being inappropriate with him. Specifically during one interview, Zoe said how she had a close relationship with Jaden, and at times she had to remember that he was much younger than her. In a 2013 interview with V Magazine, she made some pretty concerning comments. At this time, Zoe was 24, while Jaden was only 14. She said in part, quote, There were moments where I was hanging out with Jaden and thinking, I can't believe you're 14. I have to check myself, like what I say to you. Adding, quote, he has so much personality and so much swag, he is so much cooler than I am, and he's so handsome. I was always like, when you're older, you know, we'll hang out. Nope, that's inappropriate. Clearly pretty concerning that she would speak of him this way when he was barely a teenager and 10 years younger than her. But that's not all. A red carpet interview also resurfaced that is just as concerning. In the clip, we see that Zoe is on a red carpet speaking to a reporter when she notices Jaden in the background. She then calls him over and they hug during this interview. During the clip, we see Zoe call Jaden her date and even claim that he is the love of her life. At the time of this clip, Kravitz was 26 and Jaden was only 16. Zoe also said multiple times that she dragged him out to the award show that night so he could be her date. She added that she texted him that he had to come out with her, so he did. This is not the only time she's exhibited some questionable behavior. She's also been called out for her friendship with controversial fashion designer Alexander Wang. Wang has been accused of inappropriate conduct with models and other celebrities in the past and recently admitted to some of this conduct. At first, Wang denied the multiple allegations against him, calling them fabricated. But a few months later, he shared a different type of message, expressing regret for his past behavior, saying in a statement, quote, It was not easy for them to share their stories, and I regret acting in a way that caused them pain. While we disagree on some of the details of these personal interactions, I will set a better example and use my visibility and influence to encourage others to recognize harmful behaviors. Although he slightly danced around the specifics of what he did wrong, he did own up to some of the behaviors that he was accused of. If you're not aware of the friendship between Kravitz and Wang, it's been ongoing for many years. The friends are so close that Wang even made her a wedding dress for her, which is something he says he only does with his close friends. While speaking with Vogue about the dress, they described that Wang was quote, working with one of his oldest and best friends. With Wang describing quote, Zoe was very clear on her vision, something pure, elegant, timeless, but with depth. She knew the reference she wanted and that was Audrey Hepburn, but we didn't want it to feel too vintage or costumey. Apparently Wang worked on the dress for over a year and did five fittings with Kravitz. He added that working on the dress was sentimental to him and even added a special sentiment to it to honor their friendship. Wang added, quote, I made a special embroidered note for her on the inside and one for her satin lunch bag. He explains, quote, The funny story is that she used to carry a brown paper bag around with her as her purse, and we would laugh about it. So for her wedding, I remade it into a white satin. Wang added that he would only consider this undertaking if it was for a good friend, adding, quote, I don't usually do wedding dresses unless I really know the person because it's a personal and intimate process. The last concerning thing that fans are bringing up is the fact that Zoe Kravitz and Ezra Miller dated while Ezra was not of age. A viral tweet claimed that Zoe and Ezra dated when Ezra was 17 and Zoe was over 20 years old. The pair never confirmed if they actually dated or not, but in 2010 it was rumored that the pair were dating while they worked together on the set of the movie, Beware of the Gonzo. Speaking to Collider magazine at the time, Zoe said, quote, Ezra had the part and we met before I was actually hired just to get ready for a chemistry read and there was chemistry. Adding quote, we became best friends immediately. The pair have a four year age gap between them, which a lot of fans found concerning. It was reported that the pair dated for less than four months in total. While they were working together on the movie, paparazzi snapped a photo of them passionately kissing at a club, which went viral on social media. 
As of now, Zoe has not commented any further on the Will Smith slap or the claims that have been made about her. However, she did turn off the comments on the Instagram posts showcasing her Oscars dresses, so it's clear she does not want to deal with any more backlash. Since the slap, Smith has faced heavy criticism, and the Oscars are starting an investigation to determine what disciplinary action they will take. Wills apologized on social media and recently announced that he will be resigning from the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Although this hardly changes anything, all this would stop him from doing in the future is voting on the recipients of the awards at each Oscar ceremony. There are approximately 10,000 members in the Academy, all of whom are expected to quote, advance the arts and sciences of motion pictures. This resignation also won't keep Smith from attending future Oscar ceremonies. He most likely will even present the award for Best Actress in 2023, as is customary with each Best Actor winner. Smith can even be nominated and win another Oscar in the future. Academy President David Rubin said, quote, We will continue to move forward with our disciplinary proceedings against Mr. Smith for violations of the Academy's standards of conduct in advance of our next scheduled board meeting on April 18th. So I guess we'll have to wait and see how this all pans out, but let me know your thoughts on the scandal surrounding Zoe Kravitz, and how do you feel about her statements towards Will Smith? Jessica Alba used to be a mainstay in Hollywood, but then all of a sudden she disappeared and hasn't acted in much since. These are the reasons that Hollywood won't cast Jessica Alba anymore. First up, racial ambiguity. These days, being diverse in Hollywood is a positive, and most studios are looking to diversify their casting choices. But in the case of Jessica Alba, her ambiguous ethnicity hurt her casting prospects, because the industry is not able to fit her into a box like they do with other actors. Jessica Alba came up in the film industry in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when it was hard to land spots in big movies unless your complexion was very light. But it seems she was not white enough to get lead roles. Alba spoke to Pop Sugar about how her ethnicity impacted her casting, saying, quote, They couldn't figure out my ethnicity. They were like, You're not Latin enough to play a Latina, and you're not Caucasian enough to play the leading lady, so you're going to be the exotic one. After hearing comments like this, she was more determined than ever to play the leading lady. Since she's helmed tons of movies in her day, it's clear that she met that goal. However, that was short lived, and she's now rarely on the big screen. In case you were wondering, Alba stated that her mother is white and her father is Mexican-American. Aged out of roles Back when Alba was in her heyday, she was starring in movies as the bombshell side character, known mainly for her good looks. Many of her roles were all about how she looked, and increasing the sex appeal of the movie to audiences. Her main roles happened in her mid-twenties, usually a scantily clad love interest or object of desire for male characters. She even graced the pages of adult magazines like Maxim. Since Alba is now older and more mature, she would not consider playing a role like that. But since that's all she's ever played, it would be difficult for a casting director to all of a sudden put her in a different light to audiences that already know Jessica Alba's type. And most of the decisions in casting are based on audience perception. Leading roles flopped. When it comes to casting in leading roles, it does not usually come down to talent, rather how much money studios believe the actor can make. And unfortunately, Alba has not made studios much money when she was the leading lady in her films. This has essentially blacklisted her from ever helming a movie again. Jessica Alba was given a few shots at big screen stardom in the 2000s, and sadly did not deliver what executives were looking for. There are only a handful of movies that she played a prominent role in that made over $100 million at the box office. These movies were Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, which also starred other big names. Alba had smaller roles in big hits like Little Fockers and Valentine's Day, but her roles were so minimal she's hardly remembered as being in them. Honestly, most of the movies she's been in are pretty forgettable, and I would be hard pressed to name any movies that she's been in. To name some of her biggest flops, the dance flick Honey took in $30 million in 2003, Good Luck Chuck brought in $35 million in 2007, Machete earned $26 million in 2010, and Escape from Planet Earth earned $57 million in 2013. After so many box office flops, it makes no sense for the film industry to take any more chances on her. Next up, harsh reviews. Other than making money, the second benchmark of a good movie is good reviews from the audience and critics. If an actor is able to score both, they have a long career ahead of them, but not being able to get either is a recipe for disaster. Jessica Alba seems to have the disaster formula, her movies hardly make any money, along with getting horrible reviews. Not one but two movies that she's been in, An Invisible Sign and Killers Anonymous, scored a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. I didn't even know that was possible. 
while tons of other movies like Good Luck Chuck and The Love Guru failed to get over 20%. Even though she wasn't the star of any of these films, the fact that she's been in so many duds has put a stain on her relationship, because there is the potential that she is the bad egg in all of them. Many people have noticed her bad acting, and she's even won Razzies in the past, which are awards given to the worst actors and movies. She's been nominated for Worst Actress three times, Worst Screen Couple once, and actually took home the award for Worst Supporting Actress in 2011. That type of attention is not something you want if you're casting for an important movie. Gave up. One of the main reasons Alba is not working anymore is that she decided to somewhat retire when she was 27. Since then, she's been more focused on having a family and being with her kids. Alba told Access Hollywood, quote, I really stopped acting when I was 27 full time. Adding if I did do a job, it was really kind of a short period of time. But she made a point to not shut the door on acting for good, and instead only take roles when they felt like the right fit. She told Working Mother, quote, I'm open to dying diving back into acting. It's my passion and my heart. I didn't take time from acting completely, but I certainly didn't make it a focus. At this point, Alba has a big family and other business ventures, so it seems she does not regret her decision. Honest Company Speaking of Alba's other ventures, the most successful has been her beauty brand, The Honest Company. Alba co-founded the company after she had a bad experience using a traditional laundry detergent on her kids' clothes. Her newborn daughter broke out in hives after Alba washed her clothes because the baby could not handle the strong detergent. After this horrible experience, Alba set out to make products without toxins and harsh chemicals that would be safe for kids and people with sensitive skin. She hired Healthy Child, Healthy World author Christopher Gavin as a consultant, and LegalZoom founder Brian Lee to form Love and Honor, renamed The Honest Company when it launched in 2012. The company has been incredibly successful, selling $10 million worth of products in its first year. By 2015, The Honest Company offered more than 130 products and was sold in 4,400 stores. Alba's company generated $150 million that year, right around the time it enjoyed a market valuation of $1.7 billion. Since The Honest Company has been such a success, there's no reason to go back to the acting world. TV shows did no better. Movies are generally where all actors want to be. They don't call the biggest celebrities movie stars for no reason. So when Alba had a hard time getting cast in movies, she took a shot at the next best thing, television. In 2019, Jessica Alba walked away from an acting career focused on movies and took her first leading role in his episodic television show, LA's Finest. The show was about two female cops starring alongside Gabrielle Union. The type of show was pretty typical, being similar to most other cop shows, which is not great if you're trying to get out of a rut. Critical reviews were so-so and scored a 24% on Rotten Tomatoes, with audience ratings not being much better. The show also aired on Spectrum, which didn't help it get attention. Shockingly, the show was renewed for a second season. Fox also decided to buy the show and play reruns on their network to fill empty slots. But unfortunately, the show did even worse on Fox than on Spectrum. The show was obviously not picked up for a third season. After this fiasco, her days on TV were finished. Health is now her priority. While speaking with Romper Magazine, Alba revealed that she quit acting in her heyday because she wanted to focus on her health and being with her kids as much as possible. She explained to the outlet that after she had her first child, Honor, in 2008, her mindset on everything changed. She explained how her mother had cancer when she was very young, in her early 20s, and Alba herself grew up with chronic illness as a child. These experiences made her understand that health is the most important thing in life. Adding, quote, that's really what motivated me. My motivation was not like, am I ever going to get hired again? Frankly, I was at the top of my career. I couldn't go back to what I was doing before and be authentic. I just couldn't. I didn't care about it in the same way. After having children, Alba realized that she wanted to do something bigger with her life and actually make a difference in the world with the platform that she had. One of the main aspects of health is using clean products whenever possible, which is of course what drove her to start The Honest Company in 2012. If you've been following our Real Reason Hollywood Won't Cast series, then you'll pick up that most of these celebrities have either built a bad reputation for themselves or decided to walk away from it all. Today we'll be talking about why we don't really see Megan Fox involved in big Hollywood productions anymore. But first, to show some love to the channel, make sure you tap that like button. I know it's annoying to hear every time, but we really appreciate it, and it helps more people find out about the channel. So that's always nice. Now with that out of the way, let's just dive right into today's video. Megan Fox made her acting debut in the family film called Holiday in the Sun that was released in 2001. This came after numerous supporting roles in both film and television as well as a starring role in ABC's Hope and Faith. Although without a shadow of a doubt her breakout role as an actor was when she played Michaela Baines in the blockbuster action film called Transformers. She would then reprise her role in the sequel called Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. But incidents with director Michael Bay are what many attribute to her decline in Hollywood. Fox had signed up to reprise her role for a third movie with the Transformers franchise and even had gone 
on to rehearsals. However, she also did an interview where she compared Michael Bay to Hitler, and he apparently was willing to forgive her, but producer Steven Spielberg wasn't so pleased. You see, after Spielberg directed the movie Schindler's List, he founded the Survivors of the Show of Visual History Foundation to combat bigotry and keep alive the story of Holocaust survivors. So it's not surprising that when Fox made this comparison, he didn't take it lightly. During an interview with GQ magazine, Michael Bay responded to a question about the termination of Megan Fox from his film. He said, and I quote, She was in a different world. On her Blackberry, you gotta stay focused. And you know, the Hitler thing. Steven Spielberg said, fire her right now. Now apparently Spielberg has denied this version of the events and Megan's representation told People Magazine, Megan Fox will not be starring in Transformers 3. It was her decision not to return. She wishes the franchise the best. Now no matter who you want to believe though, this left the screenwriters for the film scrambling to rewrite the script given that a replacement for Fox was now required. Despite claiming to just not want to be involved with the film, Hollywood deemed Megan Fox to be too difficult to work with. Screenwriter Aaron Kruger, who was on the team for Transformers Dark of the Moon, told GQ in 2011 more issues that they had with Megan adding to this point. In that article, he's quoted as saying, she was there for rehearsals, but she seemed like an actress who didn't want to be a part of it. She was saying she wanted to, but she wasn't acting like it. Following her comments regarding Michael Bay, three crew members who had also worked on the Transformers franchise released a scathing statement just trashing Megan Fox. I mean, it's far too long to read out the entire thing, but I'll give you some of the highlights. In one section they say, Michael found this shy, inexperienced girl, plucked her out of total obscurity, thus giving her the biggest shot of any young actress's life. He told everyone around to just trust him on his choice. He granted her the starring role in Transformers, a franchise that forever changed her life. She became one of the most Googled and ogled women on Earth. She was famous. She was the next Angelina Jolie. Hooray! Wait a minute, two of us work with Angelina. Second thought, she's no Angelina. You see, Angelina is a professional. <laughs> the shade. Then in another section, these crew members start to talk about Megan's lack of interest while being on set. And who is the real Megan Fox? She is very different than the Academy nominee and winning actors we've all worked around. She's as about ungracious a person as you can ever fathom. She shows little interest in the crew members around her. We work to make her look good in every way, but she's absolutely never appreciative of anyone's hard work. Never a thank you. All the crew members have stopped saying hi to Miss Princess because she never says hello back. It gets tiring. Many think she just really hates the process of being an actress. And as a follow up to her unceremonious departure from Transformers, Megan started in a box office flop called Jennifer's Body. Then DC wanting to hop on the train like Marvel with their Iron Man 1 film and Iron Man 2 film, they started using lower tier titles and released a Jonah Hex film in 2010. Millions of potential filmgoers asked the very good question of, what the hell is a Jonah Hex? Well, he's a grizzled 19th century bounty hunter with a burned face played by Josh Brolin, while Fox played the love interest, an old west prostitute named Lila Black. Jonah Hex proved to also be a huge box office flop, earning a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes and just $10 million at the American box office. Even Megan Fox herself realized how bad that movie was. While at WonderCon in 2016, she was answering questions about which movie she would let her kids see, and here's what Megan had to say. Something like Jennifer's Body, I'm not going to let them see for a long time. Something like Jonah Hex, I'm not going to let them see ever. No one should ever see that movie. Came from herself. Now a lot of my thoughts about why Megan wasn't being cast had a lot to do with the projects on her resume more than who she is as a person. The reality is that most actors are difficult to work with, but if they are a big star, then the whole film crew just kind of bites their tongues throughout the filming. However, Megan has noticeably made a move to other mediums. She's doing more comedy with her temporary time on the sitcom New Girl, and she was just in Machine Gun Kelly's music video. But leave us a comment down below with your thoughts on what would be a better genre for Megan Fox other than action films because I think those days are gone now. If Steven Spielberg hates you, action films are out the window. Amber Heard has gone from a relatively unknown actress to one of the most talked about in Hollywood. Although it had nothing to do with her acting skills, but rather the domestic situation with her former partner Johnny Depp. We're going to be telling you all about why Hollywood shouldn't be casting Amber Heard in future flicks. Amber Laura Heard was born and raised in Texas and made her film debut in a minor supporting role for the sports drama called Friday Night Lights. Following that, she appeared in other smaller roles in both television and film. Although her first leading role came when she starred in the horror flick called All the Boys Love Manny Lane in 2006. However, the film was not released in the United States until 2013 due to distribution problems. By far, her big breakthrough roles though came in 2008 when she was cast in the action film called Never Back Down and the stoner comedy Pineapple Express, both of which were huge box office success stories. Now Amber is still booking roles, recently she took part in a TV series called The Stand, and she has one other film in pre-production. In 2011, Amber Heard worked opposite Johnny Depp in the film called The Rum Diary. The movie was about an American journalist, Paul Kemp, who takes a freelance job in Puerto Rico for a local newspaper during the 1960s. The movie follows him as he struggles to find balance between island culture and the expatriates who live there. A few years after Johnny Depp and Amber Heard first met on that set, the two began dating after Depp and longtime partner Vanessa Paradis called it quits. 
At the same time, Heard had also split with her partner Tasha Van Reed. Although that separation is really where Amber began formulating a bad reputation. According to USA Today, Amber was arrested in 2009 for physically assaulting her then girlfriend Van Reed at the Seattle Tacoma International Airport in Washington. Apparently, the two had gotten into a disagreement after Heard allegedly grabbed and hit Van Reed's arm. All charges were eventually dropped, with Tasha claiming that the situation was over sensationalized in the media. Regardless, the general public just saw the headline of Amber assaulting her girlfriend, and thus the narrative was off to the races. By 2015, Depp and Heard had gotten married in a private ceremony at their home in LA. Later that year, Amber found herself in more trouble after she breached Australia's biosecurity laws when she failed to declare that her dogs were arriving with her in the country. As a result, the couple had to do this super cringy apology video together. Fast forward to 2016, and that's where this couple's toxic side really began to show. On May 23rd, 2016, Heard filed for divorce from Depp and obtained a temporary restraining order against him as well. At the time of the divorce, Amber alleged that Depp threw a phone at her, leaving the actress with a bruised face. Although a police spokesman told People Magazine that an investigation in the domestic incident radio call found no evidence that a crime had actually taken place. Depp continued to deny the allegations made against him, and through his legal representatives, they believe Heard had concocted the story in an attempt to secure premature financial resolution by alleging this abuse. Now, here's perhaps a really good reason to never trust Amber Heard. According to The Hollywood Reporter, after their divorce was finalized in 2017, it included a non-disparagement clause, which prohibited either party from saying anything negative about the high-profile relationship and the subsequent breakup. You'd think that the drama would have ended with that, but nope. The following year, Amber wrote a scathing op-ed piece for the Washington Post in which she completely disparaged Johnny Depp without directly mentioning his name. It was very sneaky and opened up a can of worms that just couldn't be closed. In the op-ed, Heard writes, I became a public figure representing domestic and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. Which is just an outright lie. She did not become a public figure representing domestic unless she's including that assault on her former girlfriend. She isn't though. She's trying to say that she was the face of domestic after the police confirmed that there was no evidence of this. Yet still, she fully believes that she is the victim of her culture's wrath, when in reality, it was the public responding to someone lying through their teeth. The biggest indicator that she is truly living inside of her own bubble is this statement. I'm old enough to remember that in 2017, we were going through what was called the Me Too movement. Plenty of powerful and prominent men were either arrested or fired for their inappropriate actions. I'm sure by now, you're starting to get the gist of why Hollywood shouldn't be casting Amber. I mean, if you consider lying as a form of acting, well, then she's pretty good at that, but I don't think they do. And from a studio standpoint, why would you ever trust someone who has repeatedly tried to change the narrative while accepting no blame whatsoever? That doesn't really seem like the type of person that you would want to work with. Additionally, the number of signatures to have her removed from Aquaman 2 has now surpassed 1.5 million and is on its way to 2 million. That is a big deal whether Hollywood wants to admit it or not. If you put Amber in anything now, you know that there will be an outpouring of Johnny Depp supporters who will either try to get it taken down or just outright advocate for a boycott. Johnny Depp has really been been put through the ringer as of late. With Warner Brothers pressuring him to step down from Fantastic Beasts and Disney removing him from Pirates of the Caribbean, many are worried that Depp's acting days may be numbered. If you haven't figured it out already, Hollywood is filled with double standards and today we'll be breaking down exactly why Hollywood is not casting Johnny Depp anymore. Before Johnny had lost his libel case with the Sun newspaper, many production companies were deciding to stay out of the whole situation involving him and Amber Heard. Warner Brothers even said that they were refusing to pick sides and back in 2017, both the director and producer of the film defended keeping Depp in the series. Although once the hammer dropped and the judge ruled in favor of the newspaper and their original statements calling Depp a wife beater, everyone began to distance themselves. Depp then released a statement on his Instagram and said, In light of recent events, I would like to make the following short statement. Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody who has gifted me with their support and loyalty. I have been humbled and moved by your many messages of love and concern, particularly over the last few days. Secondly, I wish to let you know that I have been asked to resign by Warner Bros for my role as Grindelwald and Fantastic Fantastic Beasts, and I have respected and agreed to that request. Finally, I wish to say this, the surreal judgment of the court in the UK will not change my fight to tell the truth, and I confirm that I plan to appeal. My resolve remains strong, and I intend to prove that the allegations against me are false. My life and career will not be defined by this moment in time. Now, regardless of how much he wants to fight, these court rulings are going to be hard to come back from. Just a few years ago, Johnny Depp was one of the highest paid actors in the world, but after allegations of domestic violence, he essentially became box office poison. Not to his fans, 
obviously, but to the executive producers who are worried about being accused themselves of supporting an alleged wife abuser. That's where this whole situation of Johnny Depp being pushed out of Hollywood really stems from. According to a Washington Post report, Disney is said to have fired Depp from their Pirates of the Caribbean franchise four days after Amber Heard's 2018 op-ed article. The odd thing is that the article never actually named Depp. So Disney just acted on instinct with no evidence purely to save face. Then to make matters even weirder, they claim to be removing Depp to add a new energy and vitality to the franchise, which was most likely a cover up seeing as though they acted swiftly on this disparaging op-ed piece from Amber Heard. Although another reason why Hollywood could be refusing to cast Depp is his price tag. According to Forbes, Depp's salary including his profit percentage works out to around $100 million per film for the Pirates franchise. That being said, the last film hit crazy box office numbers. Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales registered a box office haul of nearly $800 million, which is even below the over $1 billion totals of the franchise's second and fourth films. With the third film, I think it was grossing somewhere in the ballpark of like $960 million. Whatever Disney is planning on doing with that extra $90 million or $100 million, it better be a decent replacement for Johnny Depp. Because if not, all this money will do is cover a tremendous loss to the box office. So far, the only company that has defended Johnny Depp is Dior. Depp has been the face of Dior's fragrance Sauvage since 2015, and even amid backlash from defending him, they still refuse to fire Johnny. So it's possible that we will begin to see Depp transitioning from major box office films to representing more companies that don't mind having a controversial figure as their front man. After their ad aired during the Great British Bake Off, the Advertising Standards Authority said that they received a total of 11 complaints about the ad, with the complaints believing that Johnny Depp shouldn't be in it due to the details concerning his recent court case. However, the company has been thriving on controversy for years now, and having Depp represent them has never been a better fit. Regardless of Hollywood not wanting to hire Johnny Depp anymore, he still has millions of supporters. It's also very possible that through these supporters, Johnny Depp will be able to leverage more studios that will back him. He said hopefully. Back in the early 2000s, Tobey Maguire was a highly sought after actor and also one of the highest paid at the time. Although in just a few short years, his career took a disastrous tumble that landed him on the outskirts of Hollywood. Today on the channel, we'll be talking about exactly what led to the downfall of Tobey Maguire. To really understand where everything went wrong, let's start back at the beginning, shall we? Tobey's first credited on-screen role came at the age of 15 when he was featured as a character in the sitcom called First and Ten. For most of the 1990s, he picked up several smaller walk-on roles in TV shows with his first big starring role coming in 1992 with the short-lived sitcom called Great Scott. Although even with his great start to acting, Toby never believed that he could become a professional actor. Apparently during his childhood, he even entertained the idea of becoming a chef and even wanted to enroll in a home economics class as a sixth grader. Although his mother, who once had dreams of being a professional actor, offered Toby $100 to take a drama class instead. He ended up agreeing to this and in doing so, he decided to drop out of high school to continue acting. Thanks to some luck, talent, and his good boy appearance, Toby ended up booking a lot of roles, which is actually one of the main reasons why he just isn't booking roles anymore in his older age. As time went on, Toby's baby face and softer voice began to lose its original charm. Boyish charm, I should add, that he leaned heavily on for films such as The Cider House Rules and eventually Spider-Man. The problem is that he never changed his acting style along with his own aging process. He was still attempting to depend on that boyish charm despite looking aged out. All that did was make it very difficult for audiences to connect with him and thus the decline began. One of his childhood friends, Leonardo DiCaprio, is a good example of someone who was on the same path, but as he aged, he took on more gritty roles to overcome that boy next door casting call. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say that he tried to take on different roles, but the reputation just didn't stick. In 1998, he starred alongside Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro for the film Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which is an absolutely wild movie about the life of Hunter S. Thompson, and you don't get grittier than that. Following this film, he displayed that he was capable of being a more universal actor, and in 2002, he landed his career-defining role when he was cast to play Peter Parker. With his intelligent demeanor, acting talent, and short stature, he was the perfect fit to bring the iconic character of Spider-Man to the big screen. With this movie coming out, Toby was solidified as an A-lister in Hollywood, and in the opening weekend, the movie brought in $110 million. So what do you do from there? Well, you sign a contract for two more sequels, because why not try and strike while the iron's hot? Although by 2007, when the third film rolled into theaters, his career took a drastic nosedive. The third film was heavily relying on the success of the first two, with the second film being considered one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. Even the director Sam Raimi admitted to his shortcomings of Spider-Man 3. In 2014, during an interview with The Nerdist, he said, Each and every one of those Spider-Man movies were pretty damn challenging, working in that big budget arena where so much is at stake with much beloved characters that Stan Lee created, and people really hold them so dear to them that you don't want to mess up. And I messed up plenty with the third Spider-Man, so people hated me for 
for years. They still hate me for it. It's a movie that just didn't work very well. I tried to make it work, but didn't really believe in all the characters, and so that can't be hidden from people who love Spider-Man. If a director doesn't love something, it's wrong of them to make it if so many other people love it. On top of that, Sony decided to scrap a potential fourth film because supposedly Sam Raimi couldn't get a script done on their timeline. That being said, all the blame shouldn't be put on Sam for the lack of work that Toby would get. One of the real reasons that Hollywood won't hire him is scandal. In 2011, his penchant for gambling got the better of him as he was tied up in a massive illegal poker club that allegedly involved the likes of Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and DiCaprio. He was even sued for his involvement after it was revealed that the poker ringleader Bradley Ruderman had been using investor funds to play poker with. Toby ended up settling in 2013 to avoid further litigation, and then on top of it all, he was named in Molly Bloom's scathing memoir titled Molly's Game. In the book, Molly writes about Toby and says, Jamie and Toby were all in, and I wasn't sure which one I was rooting for. Jamie had almost lost his bankroll, and once he did, I wouldn't be able to let him play anymore. I liked Jamie. He was kind and generous. Toby was the worst tipper, the best player, and the absolute worst loser. But I had to worry about my job security if he lost. I held my breath and watched Diego turn over the cards. Toby won. Although it gets worse than just him being a sore loser or a poor tipper, he's actually a sore winner. Molly continues by saying he held a thousand dollar chip in his hand. He flipped it over a couple times in his fingers. This is yours, he said, holding it out. Thanks, Toby, I said, reaching my hand out. He yanked the chip back at the last second. If, he said, if you do something to earn these thousand dollars. His voice was loud enough that some of the guys looked up to see what was happening. I laughed, trying not to show my nerves. What do I want you to do, he said, as if he were pondering. The whole table was watching us now. I know, he said. Get up on that desk and bark like a seal. I looked at him. His face was lit up like it was Christmas Eve. Bark like a seal who wants a fish, he said. I laughed again, stalling, hoping he would play the joke out by himself and leave. I'm not kidding. What's wrong? You too rich now? You won't bark for a thousand dollars? Wow, you must be really rich. These are just a few of the stories that damaged his reputation, and since the release of Molly's Game, Toby has been pretty much blacklisted from Hollywood. Hollywood.